To most of the world, Siberia means vastness and desolate, a place of cold, a frozen, forbidding wasteland. Siberia covers five million square miles, almost one-tenth of all the land of the Earth. From the Euro Mountains on the eastern edge of Europe, it stretches over 4,000 miles across Asia to the Pacific. From the borders of China and the Mongolian Republic, it reaches 2,000 miles northward to the Arctic Ocean. Within 200 miles of the Arctic Circle lives an ancient people. The Yakut horsemen of northeastern Siberia survive winters that average more than 50 degrees below zero. They're called the Iron Men of the North. They depend on herds of squat, rugged horses for food, clothing, and transportation. Their icy pasture land lies in the permafrost belt of Siberia. Four million square miles of rock-hard earth, frozen solid, in places more than a thousand feet beneath the surface. The Yakut horse is found nowhere else. No one knows for how many centuries they have been herded across this frozen desert. The origin of these nomadic people remains a mystery. Legends tell of ancestors driven from the south by hostile tribes. Anthropologists believe they are a mixture of peoples, some of whom lived here in prehistoric times. 100,000 years ago, Stone Age man pursued the woolly mammoth into Siberia in search of food. In the third century BC, Mongolian immigrants founded a primitive civilization that would last a thousand years. In the 13th century, the fierce warriors of Genghis Khan invaded Siberia. In 1582, the descendants of Genghis Khan were driven out by the Cossacks of Ivan the Terrible. Siberia became part of the Russian Empire. The Cossacks moved across the unexplored land, demanding furs as tribute to the Tsar. Over the centuries, the Russians made Siberia a place of exile and oppression. First came the criminals, later the enemies of the state, clergymen, intellectuals, and political dissenters. What began as a Cossack outpost on the Angara River 300 years ago is today Siberia's eighth largest city, the plain gray city of Irkutsk, halfway between Moscow and the Pacific. Winter lasts six months here, and temperatures drop to 50 below. This city of half a million is the hub of an industrial area expected to double in population by 1980. To recruit a labor force to Siberia, the Soviet government has offered wages as much as 40% higher than in European Russia. Irkutsk has become a cosmopolitan city with a university, concert halls, and theaters. Yet there is much about the city that gives it the appearance of an overgrown Siberian village. Every day the people come to the marketplaces. 
Traditional stalls are clustered near the heated indoor government market. In the giant union of Soviet socialist republics, this is one small outpost of free enterprise. The stalls are rented from the government, but prices are set by supply and demand. Sometimes, within miles of Siberia's great pulp mills, there are no paper bags for shoppers. out for the day. Ten years of schooling is compulsory, and all children study the arts and sciences and at least one foreign language. Also, they have a great range of non-school activities through the Young Pioneer Organization, the youth movement of the Communist Party. This girl is on her way to a ballet class. She has two lessons a week. Like all the girls in the class, Olga Sokolnikova dreams of someday attending the famous ballet school in Leningrad. The circus has been a cherished part of Russian culture for some 300 years. Since the revolution, circuses have been part of a state system. About 4,000 performers now appear in dozens of Soviet cities. The circus that regularly performs in Irkutsk is a showcase for promising young talent. They began training at a state school at a young age. A few, the best, will join the Moscow Circus and the elite of Soviet performers. In the Soviet Union, clowning is a respected art, combining pantomime with satire. Slapstick is usually laced with social commentary. Here in the circus arena, the system's red tape and inefficiency can be ridiculed openly, to the delight of the audience. On a hill overlooking Irkutsk stands a church almost as old as the city itself. Once it was the center of the town's spiritual life. Now only a small percentage of the population attends religious services. The 
Eastern Orthodox Church, which claims to be the oldest in Christendom, has endured a half century of government opposition and persecution within the Soviet Union. Today, some religion is grudgingly tolerated by the state. In a communist state, formal religion seems destined to die with the older generation. In midwinter, darkness comes early in Irkutsk at 4.30. The main avenues will be almost deserted by 6. Far to the north, where there are no paved highways or railway, Winter convoys of trucks carry supplies to towns and villages. Some trucks travel a perilous 1,200 miles north from a railhead of the Trans-Siberian. Convoys carry everything from household goods to heavy machinery. frontier town to the north, just about all the necessities of life must come from outside. However, there is plenty of reindeer meat to eat during the eight months of winter. In the town of Oymyakon, even bread is delivered frozen solid. This community of 3,500 is the coldest inhabited spot on earth. The temperature has dropped to 96 below. Houses are built with triple windows and walls three feet thick. Here there are no milk bottles. Milk is carried home unwrapped in a frozen slam. It's a harsh climate, exhausting for both man and beast. It takes two thick panes of glass to protect a truck driver from the winter. Nothing protects him from the treachery of snow and ice. In the winter, breakdowns are routine. Because of the low temperature, metal parts break, tires split open. But the drivers are prepared for these emergencies. They always travel in convoys of not less than four or five trucks. So no man is left on his own. If he were, he could freeze to death. Anatoly Romanov was born in Moscow 35 years ago. Now he lives in Siberia with his wife and family. For 12 years, he's been driving north on frozen rivers and roads of hard-packed snow that drivers call Zimniki. The trucks average about 40 miles an hour over the treacherous land. It's often hundreds of miles between stops, and darkness comes in late afternoon.
shelter for the night is a government hostel established for the truckers at critical distances along the way. Romanoff is fairly typical of the drivers. Most are graduates of the State Automotive School. All are skilled mechanics. Romanoff earns 600 rubles a month. In the very first light of dawn, the convoy set out for another day's journey. Along the roadway, an unconventional monument to the truck drivers of the Siberian North. The simple folk tunes of the Russian people have always expressed love of nature and the land. In a Siberian kindergarten, children are taught the same songs their ancestors sang. The children sing of birch trees and the coming of spring. The wilderness is part of their lives, part of their past, and part of their future. Their cities lie within the taiga, a forest a thousand miles wide and three thousand miles long, a forest the Siberians call the Green Sea. It's not all wilderness. There are riches here. In early times, men came to trap and trade for furs. Now, there are huge fur farms where fox and sable are bred. The fur industry brings in $62 million a year. Fur was the first of Siberia's natural resources to be exploited. There are many more. There are rich mineral deposits, copper, gold, silver, and tin. The Great Green Sea provides vast quantities of timber. fairly extensive agriculture despite a scarcity of suitable land and a short growing season. One resource is abundant, the raw power of the many great rivers. One dam, the Bratsk, took 10 years to build, rises 400 feet above the river, and forms a lake of 2,000 square miles.
The hydroelectric plant at Bratz is presently the world's largest. When construction began, there was nothing but wilderness, a few tents and a rough camp for the workers. Now, Bratsk is a city of 134,000 people, the heart of a rapidly expanding manufacturing region. Siberia, life is beginning to break away from traditional patterns. The spirit of change is reflected in the arts. In Novosibirsk, young composers are creating music which expresses something of the character of their land. With the arts, the sciences. This is the scientist Mikhail Lavrentiev who founded a city. Akadjim Gorodok, the science city, is the spearhead of a Soviet plan to open up Siberia with the sciences of the space age. Sharing the work for a time were some American visitors, the Ragland family. Dr. Kenneth Raglan spent a year of intensive research in the nuclear physics lab. From the University of Michigan, he was part of a scientific exchange program. <laughs> Mrs. Nancy Raglan taught English in the city's public school. Partly because it's the international language of science, English has become the second language of Akadjem Gorodok. The Raglan children, Lisa six and Laura eight, learned Russian. is a time in Siberia which shatters the conventional image. The few brief weeks of spring and summer. days when the hot sun sends the temperature over 90 degrees. But a few feet below the grass and the flowers, the earth is still frozen solid. Summer is only an interlude. All too soon, winter comes. Siberia can be cruel and desolate. But the people who live here love this land and understand its frozen, majestic beauty. Thank you. 